Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. As many of you know, over the past two or three months, various organisations and institutions have been representing and re-emphasising the seriousness of the predicament we face when it comes to climate change. We've tried to cover most of those reports on this channel and they all seem to share one significant viewpoint and that is that if we're to stand any chance of keeping global temperature rises to less than two degrees above pre-industrial levels, then some sort of carbon capture and storage is going to be necessary. Now there are of course loads of you out there who think that we're already way past the point of no return and as you know I've read a lot of your comments with interest. My view for what it's worth is that despite the seemingly overwhelming odds, it's vital that we strive for any solutions wherever we can find them. But alongside that though, is the need for very careful consideration of the potentially negative implications and outcomes of any technology we choose to employ. And that kind of brings me nicely to the subject of BEX, or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And this is the one that I mentioned last week, the IPCC are banking on to make all their climate projections work. Well, that and ignoring the fact that methane levels in the Arctic are rising at a truly alarming rate, but that's a subject for another week. Anyway, in the IPCC projections that keep below two degrees of warming, BEX is assumed to remove up to 3.8 billion tonnes of CO2 per year up to 2050, and then up to 14 billion tonnes of CO2 per year by 2100. So this week I'm going to try and understand the pros and cons and find out why there are so many scientists and other apparently well-informed people who seem to be completely dead against it. Just like the DAX technology we looked at last week, BEX is fairly straightforward in theory. You set aside some land and you grow a specific set of crops and trees on that land. And those trees and crops pull CO2 out of the atmosphere during the photosynthesis process which makes them grow. You harvest those crops, burn them to produce useful energy for domestic heat and power or for industrial processes, and then capture the CO2 that the combustion process produces and bury it underground in depleted oil and gas reservoirs or aquifers where it's locked up for millennia. So far, so good. And one of the things that makes BEX so appealing to the IPCC is the relatively high concentration of CO2 that you can get at the exits of chimneys and flues of factories and energy producers. If you can capture the stuff at source, goes their thinking, then you're mitigating the emissions problem immediately and effectively. According to this timeline at Carbon Brief, the technology first came into being as far back as 1998. So how come it's not been enthusiastically implemented all over the globe, cancelling out all other CO2 emissions that we humans produce? Well, in trying to answer that question, we have to consider the scale of the proposals. First up is land use. According to the IPCC, the average amount of BECs in the RCP pathways requires 25 to 46% of arable and permanent crop area in 2100. Now that's a huge amount of land. The folks at the website avoid.uk.net conducted a study called Avoid 2, which showed that just 20% of all agricultural land is an area the size of Australia. So if BECs were to be adopted on this kind of scale, then it's likely that existing forest land would have to be removed to make way for massive plantations of fast-growing monocultures that could quickly remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And that would mean the loss of precious and complex ecosystems with no way of getting them back. Returning to the Carbon Brief website, Dr Anna Harper, a research fellow and lecturer in climate science at the College of Engineering, Mathematics and Physical Sciences at the University of Exeter, talks about the findings of her studies on the pros and cons of BEX. She says, overall, we found that in a majority of the areas where forests would be replaced, more carbon was stored by keeping the forests than with employing BEX. And if existing farmland was commandeered as well, then you'd get a big spike in food prices around the world and a lot of small scale farmers and food producers would most likely be pushed out of business. The AVOID2 study also pointed out that the IPCC pathways that keep global temperature rises around the 1.5 to 2 Celsius mark mean CO2 removal of up to 1300 billion tonnes in total by 2100. But the maximum they say we could hope for from an Australia-sized plot of land would be about 500 billion tonnes in total. So there's no silver bullet solution here based on those numbers. You'd probably need something more like the size of Africa in addition to get to the upper number, and that's clearly not a viable proposition. And then of course you've got to water the crops and chuck a load of fertiliser all over them to make sure they grow strongly. Estimates indicate that that 
could double the global consumption of both those commodities. If you put that against the population rise we looked at last week, and the fact that according to the UN at least 5 billion people could be facing water shortages by 2050, then BEX starts to look like it might put an extra pressure on world resources that we may really struggle to cope with. And before all of that watering and fertilising, you have to prepare the land by ploughing it and tilling it to turn over the soil, and that actually releases carbon dioxide. And let's not forget the tractors and the lorries and all the other vehicles required to transport all the crops from where they're grown to where they can be burned and stored underground. And those locations could well be some distance apart. And all that transport potentially produces another big volume of CO2. In this extensive study for the Royal Society of Chemistry, conducted by Mathilde Fajardi and Neil McDowell, they state, overall, we conclude that depending on the conditions of its deployment, BEX could lead to both carbon positive and carbon negative results. Not exactly a glowing endorsement. Nevertheless, BEX is still being actively researched and developed by governments and organisations all around the world, including the US and the UK. Back once again to Carbon Brief and yet another report, this one from March of last year, looking at the US territory and how it might lend itself to BEX. The report notes, the researchers find that there are enough suitable areas of the US to remove around 110 to 120 million tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere by 2020, and 360 to 630 million tonnes by 2040. This is similar to what energy models assume will be deployed across the US in a world where warming is limited to well below 2 degrees C. So that sounds like a very positive outlook, and it goes on to say, the US is of particular interest for the initial development and deployment of BEX because it has relatively high biomass productivity and well-mapped geologic storage sites for CO2. The US also has a relatively mature bioenergy industry, as well as a number of pilot-scale CO2 injection projects, and the types of biomass available in the US look to be relatively favourable as well. According to the report, the US Department of Energy estimates that around 220 million tonnes of biomass could be available each year for use by 2020. Around 50% of this biomass would come from agricultural residues, 40% from a combination of offcuts from logging and trees harvested specifically for biomass, with the remaining 10% from crops grown specifically for bioenergy. And that means that at least in the short term, there'd be limited displacement of cropland for bioenergy because much of it can come from waste sources. Back here in the UK, BEX also seems to have been the subject of governmental scrutiny, and it seems to have wandered in and out of favour over the past couple of years. According to Dave Elliott in his report for Physics World, the UK government, having previously said we should move away from biomass burning back in 2018, have changed their tune and are now coming out enthusiastically for BEX. The United Kingdom Committee on Climate Change has recently stated, based on our current expectations of BEX costs and technical performance, we conclude that biomass available for use in the energy system, which is to say after wood in construction opportunities have been satisfied, should be used with BEX applications to the maximum extent possible. And that led me on to report that the fossil fuel industry also seemed to be enthusiastically pursuing this and all other CO2 capture technologies. For example, in their 2012 report for the website Biofuel Watch, Rachel Smolker and Almuth Ernsting point out that the promotion of carbon capture technologies like BEX for climate change mitigation and geoengineering coincides with the oil industry's fast-growing demand for cheap, continuous supplies of CO2. So this didn't make a lot of sense to me. Why would they be back in a technology that could potentially do harm to their revenues? Well, as we've found out many times on this channel, the fossil fuel industry money makers may be many things, but stupid is not one of them. It turns out that flooding oil reservoirs with CO2 allows for the recovery of a far higher proportion of oil than would be possible with conventional means. They don't call it CO2 flooding, of course, they call it enhanced oil recovery, and it offers the fossil fuel industries potentially several more decades of oil production as Rachel and Asmuth state in their article. Despite the fact that enhanced oil recovery leads to the recovery and burning of potentially vast quantities of fossil fuels which would otherwise have remained under the ground, use of CO2 for this purpose is classed as a form of carbon capture and storage. 
a claim that's accepted even by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Whichever side of the argument you come down on, it's clear that BEX and other negative emissions technologies will never provide a nice, neat solution to our climate crisis. Arguably, the most critical action we need to take collectively is to decarbonise our economies as fast as possible, which of course means eradicating fossil fuels from the energy mix altogether and getting ourselves onto renewable energy technologies that make use of integrated and distributed smart grids across continents. It also means protecting the carbon sinks we already have on our planet, like our forests and oceans, which is something we're clearly not doing at the moment. There's a mind-boggling quantity of CO2 locked up in both of those natural reservoirs. Back in October, this Guardian article carried a report by a group of 40 scientists spanning five countries, and their message was simple and clear. Raising the world's forests would release more than three trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide, more than the amount locked up in identified global reserves of oil, coal and gas. By protecting and restoring forests, the world would achieve 18% of the emissions mitigation needed by 2030 to avoid runaway climate change. And I would have thought that's surely a goal worth striving for. Lots of different info from all sorts of different sources this week, all of which contain far more data and analysis than can possibly be squeezed into a little video like this. So I'll leave links to all the uh, articles that I've quoted this week in the comments section below so that you can go and have a look at them for yourself. That's it for this week. If you've enjoyed watching the programme, please hit the like button and share the video and also consider subscribing so that we can get the word out to as many people as possible. And you can do that absolutely for free by clicking here. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.